Um, with respect to count number one, charge of murder in the first degree after deliberation, we the jury find the defendant Letitia Stauk guilty of count number one, murder in the first degree after deliberation. With respect to count number two, charge of murder in the first degree, child under 12 by a person in a position of, of trust, we the jury find the defendant Letitia Stauk guilty of count number two, murder in the first degree, child under 12, position of trust. With respect to count number three, uh, charge of tampering with a deceased human body, we the jury find the defendant Letitia Stauk guilty of count number three, tampering with a deceased human body. With respect to count number four, <coughs> charge of tampering with physical evidence, we the jury find the defendant Letitia Stauk guilty of count number four, tampering with physical evidence. Um, I wanted to ask the jury, uh, or actually the four person, there is some extra writing on here with respect to uh, question number one, there's a cross through and some initials. And then on part B, there's also a cross through with initials. Was that signifying that you were not answering that and you intended to answer guilty as to that charge? Yes. Sir. All right. And uh, is that what you intended with all of the other verdict forms? Yes, sir. All right. Um, with that, does either side wish to have the jury pulled prosecution? Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> all right. What this means is that uh, this is a process that is sometimes requested by the attorneys following a verdict to make sure that everybody has agreed on all parts of it. So I'll go down the row, starting in the back. Juror number one, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number two, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number three, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number four, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number five, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number six, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number seven, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number eight, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number nine, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number 10, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number 11, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number 12, is this and are these your verdicts? I want to thank all of you uh, for your service. Jurors don't get a lot of training. However, you all were selected because you were willing to be open-minded and impartial and were willing to make decisions based on the facts and the law. You, the jury, heard and saw the evidence. You paid attention all day, every day. Someone else may tell you they disagree with or uh, they disagree with your verdict or some aspect of your service. They may want to express their opinion on the matter. However, we didn't ask them for any of their opinions. We asked you for your judgment. We asked you for your verdict based on the law and based on the evidence. Someone else may tell you they think they're better and smarter and more intuitive than all of you were. Ignore them. As a judge, rarely does a day go by that I don't make somebody in the courtroom mad. The fact that some people may disagree with your verdict or the law only means that those who disagree with you were not carefully selected to be fair and impartial. They did not take an oath to follow the law and to judge all of the facts and they see it differently from you because they didn't see it all from the perspective you did. And they did not discuss the facts with 11 others who were also fair and impartial and sworn to follow the law. You decided this case. This verdict is your verdict. And this is the verdict in the case. No poll, no approval or disapproval, and no press analysis changes that fact. This is the verdict in the case. The press or someone else at some point may wish to talk to you. We live in a world of 
exceptional voyeurism in reality TV, and this is about as real as it gets. They may try to dissect the evidence, your thought process, and your decision. It's a free country. Anyone can ask you anything about your verdict. You can answer if you choose. They can also, however, respect your privacy and allow you to contact them only if you want to talk to them. And if you don't want to, you don't have to talk to anyone about your verdict. <laughs> if you do talk with someone, you can tell them as little or as much as you like. Someone may even ask you to give an affidavit regarding some aspect of your jury service. You're free to give an affidavit. You're free to decline to give an affidavit. That is a personal decision you are entitled to make. If anyone continues to talk to you after you have told them you do not want to speak about the matter or becomes critical of you or your jury service, please report that incident to me. Again, I want to thank you very much for your service. Without honest people of our community serving on jurors, we cannot secure the right to a jury trial in this country. And it's a very valuable and a very important right. I want to leave you with some language from a case that was decided by the United States Supreme Court in Louisiana versus Duncan. In that case, um, an individual was denied the right to a jury by trial, or a trial by jury, sorry. And that case went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court sent it back to the state of Louisiana. And it said, you need to give this man what the Constitution requires, which is a tr uh, trial by jury. And when it sent the case back to Louisiana, it said, we believe that trial by jury is fundamental to the American scheme of justice. Trial by jury is more than an instrument of justice and more than one wheel of the Constitution. It is the lamp that shows that freedom lives. Without your dedication and sacrifice, that lamp would not shine as brightly as it does. So I, I truly thank you for your service. You are now discharged with the thanks of the court. And for the last time, all rise for the jury, please. Thank you. You may all be seated. Um, I don't know how you want to proceed uh, on sentencing. I do need to talk to the jury uh, for a few minutes because I need to tell them some things about um, security issues, counseling issues, and things like that. So I do need to talk with them uh, for a few minutes. I also didn't know if uh, the family, the prosecution, uh, anybody um, wanted to have some time to process the verdicts. I also understand that everybody's been here for five weeks, so I get that part too. So I'm open to whatever you want to do uh, with respect to sentencing, um, but I probably am going to need at least a half an hour with the jury. I think that would be appropriate, Judge. Um, the people are obviously ready to go to immediate sentencing. I believe defenses as well. And, okay. and I can tell you that the family's been um, thinking about this day for over three years. They're ready to go to sentencing as well. Okay. Then give me about 30 minutes uh, and we will come back and proceed to sentencing at that point in time. All right. Man, the judge's camera is not on today. There you could see um, Al right here. I'll just try to zoom in a bit. All right. Just step up to the uh, podium there and just state your name. Sound is on victim statements. Nicole Mobley, N-I-C-O-L-E. 
M-O-B-L-E-Y. I just want to initially thank you for everything that you've done through all of this, as well as the prosecution. Um, I'm. This has been well over three years of a family, as well as hundreds or thousands of us who have gone through a lot. Um, it's been hard. It's been heartbreaking. And to finally see some kind of justice, especially for his family, is incredible. And I just want to thank everybody for everything that you guys have done. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Jane? They said the judge's mic wasn't on, but you can hear now, right? We can all hear. I can hear. <coughs> Hello, Your Honor. My name is Janie Cadenas. All right. Can you spell that last name? C-A-D-E-N-A-S. Okay, go ahead. Also, like what Nicole said, wanted to thank you for making this such a fair and neutral trial through the process. Um, I am here today, as I have sat with the family for the last three years as a community member in Larson Ranch, who has watched the turmoil that this has caused everybody in our community. Three years ago, we heard as a neighborhood what happened, that a little boy went missing, and we rallied together in a way that most communities can never experience or imagine we came together and we helped find ways to get media involved, to get search parties involved, to do everything we could to be of assistance to find this little boy because Gannon wasn't just a neighbor. He was all of our little boys for months and months until he was found. We were all scared to let our kids go outside because we were scared that they would be kidnapped. We didn't know what was going to happen. And through that process, we all came together and we met Landon and Al, those of us that didn't know them, and we built relationships and friendships and, and garnered a family relationship with them through that process. But this is just one thing that as a community member, somebody who was a part of it from the beginning, that I can confidently say, this is the worst tragedy that anybody could ever go through and every parent's nightmare. And I have watched and held Landon as she falls apart time after time. <clears throat> but we are here today and justice has finally been served for Gannon. And I, we want to thank you as a community for that opportunity for this to happen today. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you, Your Honor. My name is Jeff Davenport, J-E-F-F-D-A-V-E-N-P-O-R-T. Right. Um, I am Gannon's great uncle. Um, I'm Albert Tunkel. And my sister, Debbie, who hopefully will be spoken, speaking in a few minutes, is his grandmother. Uh, because I am a couple of steps away from him in relation, um, even though uh, I have personal memories of Gannon and the, the loving, wonderful young man that he was and the great man he would have been, um, I want to leave the depth of impact to his parents. Uh, so I would like to talk about um, the breadth of impact. Um, the preciousness of an 11 year old's life is beyond measure and all other impacts to all the rest of us pale in comparison to the loss he suffered himself. Um, but this now convicted murderer um, did not just murder Gannon. She murdered all of the love and joy and encouragement and security he would have brought to all those he encountered throughout his life. She murdered his children and his grandchildren and all of the joy and love and encouragement and security they would have brought to all those they encountered throughout their life and so on and so on. She murdered his junior prom, his senior prom, his high school graduation, his college years, his career, his marriage, his retirement and his golden years. And it just goes on and on. Because of her crime, all of our fragile trust in one another has been further eroded. It's not an exaggeration to say that millions of people throughout the world have heard of this crime and will, as a consequence, be less trusting and more suspicious of those in whose care they entrust their children, even those who have loved and cared for their children for years. And because of her specious 
cynical, calculated use of the MGRI defense in this case, those who are truly mentally ill will be treated with more suspicion and may not receive the help that they need. The reverberations of her murder of Gannon will ripple throughout eternity, and the impact of her crime is truly incalculable. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Judge. Veronica Birkenstock, spell V E R O N I C A, Birkenstock, B I R K E N S T O C K. I am Landon's aunt, Veronica, or Aunt V, and his great aunt. Nothing in life prepares you for the murder of a child. No one ever thinks this can happen to your family. A little over three and a half years ago, I got a call, a very dreaded call that I needed to come and be with Landon. For over three years, I have dear left her side and all the hearings, all the motions, and all the hearings that the defendant decided not to come to because she didn't think it was important. But regardless, we showed up and we showed up for Gannon. I want to talk about forgiveness today because as a Christian, I have to forgive, not because I want to, because this human flesh does not want to. The judge today, on behalf of Landon and I, we want this court to know that we have forgiven Letitia for what she did. God is the ultimate judgment, judger. But I pray today that you judge will give her what she deserves on this earth. And we'll let God do the rest in eternity. I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but I would like to leave this Bible. And at some point in time, if you think it's okay to give to Letitia as she serves her life sentence, and we hope that will be a punishment that you render shortly. But this is a life application Bible. For the rest of her natural life, I hope she will read the Word of God. And I hope that she will turn from her evil ways and the things that she did to our family. I have sat here for six weeks, and I have listened to the horrendous things that she did to my nephew. I don't want the last memory of him to be what she did to him. Our last memory of Gina was one of fun, love, joy, so articulate, and despite everything, he was gifted and intelligent. He wasn't supposed to live. The day he was born, the doctors told us he had really no chance. He weighed one pound. And a few ounces. I'll never forget the picture that Albert sent when he took his wing ring and it would fit all the way to his shoulder. For months, I saw Landon and Albert pray over their baby. And the one of the happiest days was the day he got to come home. And I was there with them. I got to spend the first night holding him for the first time and looked in his beautiful little eyes and he fought so hard to get there. His 11 years did have impact. And I want us to remember again, and it's who he was, not what this evil deed did to his memory. He is our hero and will always be our hero. Letitia tried to steal many things from my niece. She called her a drug addict. She called her homeless when she was in the hospital having her third child. She was there for months and months trying to save her life and her baby. She wasn't homeless. Landon's a good mother. She loved her children. And she loved Gannon. And her only son was taken away by someone who was just ferociously jealous of my niece. With all that being said, I pray that you will give her the sentence that she deserves. But I also pray that God will forgive her if she repents and turns from her evil ways. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Rogers, B-O-B, R-O-G-E-R-S. Um, my wife, Patty, and I are grandparents to um, Lena and Gannon, who we never had the opportunity to meet in person. Over the past couple of years, there's been a lot of tears and challenges uh, with Al, if we hopefully uh, helped him walk through this tragedy. Um, the person that comes to mind for me is Lena. Lena is Gannon's younger sister. And uh, we have the opportunity to be grandparents to her. And she's a beautiful child. 
She sings <laughs> beautifully. She's talented. What she doesn't have is an older brother to stand beside her as she goes through her life. She still mentions Gannon quite often, her brother. We never want the spirit of Gannon or the memory of Gannon uh, to be lost. So um, I just uh, <laughs> am a loss for words. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I am Deborah Pierce, P-E-A-R-C-E. Sorry. And it's grandmother. And I just wanted to thank you, first of all, Your Honor, for this court. Everything that's been done for everyone who has so carefully and impartially cared for this case, for this loss of this precious child. And I feel that if Gannon were here today, he would say, please, please protect my family and be concerned for the loss that they've had. Um, this has gone from my children to my grandchildren, little children who lost a cousin who never understood why something like this could happen. <laughs> if he were here today, he would say, please take care of my family. Make sure that they're protected as, as time goes on and as, as life goes on. Um, and obviously to help us to go forward in this life. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Oh boy, prepare yourself guys. This is tough. I think Landon is going to talk now. Hmm. Hello, Your Honor. Um, my name is Landon Bullard, also referred to as Hyatt in this case, but Bullard's B-U-L-L-A-R-D. I miss you, Gannon, and I love you to the moon and back and back again. I know every day you're with me and your sisters. But that will be never, that will never be taken away. The ache that I have for you to hold you, to hug you, to tell you how much I love you and to see your smile and your innocence. I remember all the pain your dad and I suffered with having children. It was never easy and we were always fearful through the process. On September the 29th, 2008, our lives were forever changed. Our first biggest blessing came into the world, weighing only one pound and six ounces. You fought all the odds and developed a personality and a smile that's larger than life. You became my hero that day. You forever changed my heart and my life, and that will never change. That is something that can never be taken away from me. You came into this world fighting. And unfortunately, you left this world fighting. Your Honor, she fought against someone that he loved and trusted. Someone that myself and Albert both trusted and loved. Someone who can never understand what it means to love or trust anyone but herself. For more than three agonizing years, I've often wondered what I may say. Or if I would even be able to. For three years, I have questioned every single possibility and scenario. For three years, I have tried to forgive you, but I can't. I want to. But no parent should have to bury their child. No parent should have to see or hear the horrific things you have done to the whole family. She has taken away the most precious gift in this world. Not just my family. Not Al's family but your own family. She destroyed dozens of lives, lives of people who never wanted to believe that she could have done this. She knew how special Gannon was, and she knew what me meant to most of me. I, in my heart, can never understand her hatred and insecurities when it came to me. I did love her. 
Mother to mother, I trusted her with my children while trying to survive a complicated life with my third child. And you used, she used every opportunity to write a narrative of my life to, again, to try to take pieces of my life. When she already took some of it, that still wasn't enough. She searched. I lost my place. <laughs> I don't know where I'm at now. You searched, she searched so hard for love when all along she had it, but she took it for granted. I didn't hold anger against you then. I still kept my heart open to her. She had so, you had so much love from Lena and Gannon, from Harley, her own daughter, that you were willingly, you willingly subjected to the chance of serving time for her crimes. Such an indicator of her inability to love anyone herself. You had support, appreciation for me, even when we couldn't see eye to eye, because I valued her for helping, helping me with our children when I physically couldn't. Even when I was fighting for my kids, as you wrote a false smear campaign against me and my children, and also Al. For me, I still appreciated that they were loved by you. So I thought she had everyone fooled. She pro projected abuse and addiction claims against all of us, not just me, when all along she was the one harming innocent children, anything to take the light off, manipulating us, breaking my kids and murdering my son. I can't say that she ruined my life because that would be some form of sick victory for her. Because even through this process, it's been a game to her. The people who listened doesn't know her style or her sly jabs. She's even made it, Albert and I. They, know, they do not know the significance of certain things she says or does. But we do. Instead of allowing her to take that power of hurting me further, I wanted to tell you this. Let me tell you what Gannon has done. Even to this day, even after you murdered him and she tried to taint any positive image of him, he has caused families and communities to come together. Children and adults have given their life to Christ. He has called unity in times of trial. He is a hero. You even, she even tried to steal that away. A cape, huh? The one image of Gannon that was created for the world. After it went national, TV begging for the return of my son, my hero, how dare her? How truly sick and cruel is she? You stole so much from this world, Gannon's cousins, aunts, uncles, sisters, new siblings, grandparents, and friends are missing a huge portion of their lives without Gannon. Lena is missing her brother. Your Honor, I've never seen a bond between two siblings so close as theirs. She had to take that. Why? I'm afraid we may never know that answer, will we? I show his baby sister, Nova, pictures and videos of Gannon so she will always remember who he is because she stole him from us. He is not forgotten and never will be. And it's so sad to sit here today and face her, a person even Gannon loved, one that I know while she was attacking and killing him and fought for his life, he defended himself against her, still loving her. A love she never deserved from him for what she has done. While, you are, while she is too much of a coward to even come forward with the truth, she owes it to Gannon. But the lack of remorse and the lack of respect to Gannon through this child, her lack of compassion shows me that she and we, well, we were all wrong. She manipulated all of us, all of us and never loved Gannon, Lena, or Harley. I've sat here for over a month having to listen to her sick lies even as she tried to destroy who I was and Albert at, as a father, I've had to sit and listen and watch every reenactment of images no one wants left in their mind. You wanted to leave us with that, knowing it would torture us. But you underestimated me. I am Landon, Gannon's mom, and that will never change. Through my hurt, anger, and pain, I will never be the monster that she is. I can never be filled with the hate 
that her heart holds. I pray that we will never have to look at her face again. I will continue to hold on to my faith. Vengeance is not mine as I surely wish it could be at times, but it's the Lord's. I have to trust in that. Thank you, Judge Warner, for your compassion, your patience through this trial. I want to thank the juror for their attentiveness and time that they took for joy, justice for my boy, to the detectives, officers, legal team for every single second they've poured out into Gannon's case, and to the community for your countless hours. Tisha, that was her biggest mistake. You underestimated this community and this defensive team, Lorson Ranch. They searched for and fought for Gannon within hours, and they never believed your lies. From the moment they started, none of these people ever gave up on him. You never looked. All of these people I will forever hold close to my heart. Always gain and strong. My gene men forever. Justice has been served today. Your Honor, I pray that you just give her the best sentencing, the longest sentencing that you can. <clears throat> this will not bring my son back, but I can sleep soundly for the first time in three years knowing that you can never harm this defendant can never harm anyone again, knowing Gannon will always be a true hero in a cape. He will always be my son. That will never be taken away. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Allen. Once I was seven years old, my mama told me, go make yourself some friends or you'll be lonely. Once I was seven years old. It was a big, big world, but we thought we were bigger. Pushing each other to the limits, we were learning quicker. Ralph Stalk. Gannon's father, capital F A T H E R. Last name Stauk. S T A U C H. Uh, I'm gonna start with um something from my wife, not to go out of order, but she yep. didn't think she could make it through it. So this is my wife, Melissa, and these are her words. Some may say or think that I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Tisha. In part, that may be accurate, and I would be okay with that, because then Gannon would still be here. I, too, know the pain of losing a child, and there is no greater pain. We are now lifelong grief partners, as this is a lifelong journey of pain with two sons waiting for us in heaven. Oh. I have some words from my daughter, Elena, I will uh, address in the middle of my speech, but they're written in yellow, so I don't know if I should leave it to a child. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever God may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but I'm bowed. Beyond this place of the wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. The poem I read is named Invictus, translated from the Latin means unconquerable. I quoted this same poem at Gannon's Memorial here in Colorado Springs back in August of 2020. Why August of 2020? When his body was ripped to shreds on January 27th? Well, as we heard testimony to, his body was found 1,370 miles away. And then the process to identify his maggot-infested remains was held in from us until July 2020. <sighs> As I stated in my testimony on the stand, Gannon was support, born severely premature and barely filled my two hands the first time I held him. At the end of his life, 
After his body was cremated into a pile of ashes, he was ultimately no bigger than the first time I held him. As brutal as the wait became, I'm thankful to God and the bridge workers for finding him and returning his precious body to Landon and I. I quote the poem Invictus again, not to boast of my strength and perseverance, Your Honor, but to say to the world, I alone can control my actions and reactions. Your Honor, I refuse to allow anger to poison my soul and orient my life to a pursuit of vengeance. I refuse to allow pain to carry me through each day and promote the pursuit of medicinal retribution toward the offender. I refuse also to let my mind be clouded by inconsistency and emotions that deter me from the purpose in this life. Your Honor, the price I pay each and every day for this resolve is to only get pieces and parts of my son. consistently through time but the pain is too heavy and the anger too overwhelming and the desire for vengeance too vexing instead each and every day i pursue peace i seek joy in my life and let the love i have for my wife and family flow in and out of me like a mighty wave as i told tisha regularly at the end of our relationship my joy is mine alone and she cannot rob me of that I will learn to experience G more and more as time goes on, but as I did my best to instill into his precious soul, love, joy, service, and kindness are the pathway to take in life. This picture shows that in the fourth grade, he already had a mind for service. Throughout these past three years since Gannon was beaten and drugged, carved up, Shot at point blank range and discarded like yesterday's garbage. I've encountered many people that would figuratively do the same to me. I have been questioned, compared as Tisha did to my abusive father, and ridiculed for my, for my approach to finding Gannon. I hope now that the world has seen that I was assigned the most arduous task of finding Gannon in the only place that was possible for him to have, my, have been in the mind of a killer. Were my efforts fruitful? I believe so. But from the moment I did not see the Volkswagen Tiguan, Tiguan, Tiguan or however you say it, at French elementary on that Tuesday evening, a clear direction for finding Gannon pointed directly and precisely at Tisha. While others online, some who are even in the courtroom today, questioned my perceived lack of effort or concern, I stood still and stood firm in knowing that only one person had the information needed to find Gannon. Now I say woe to the person who questions a father's resolve when the safety and well-being of his children are at stake. I did not waver. I did not falter in the pursuit, nor did I allow the mentality of the mob to shake me. But it was only by the grace of God that Gannon's precious body was finally found. In Mark 4.39 of the Bible, in the middle of a storm, Christ arose and rebuked the wind and said, peace, be still. In times of trial in my life, from seeing my father being taken away in handcuffs, seeing that sweet one pound, six ounce baby boy for the, my firstborn son being put into a Ziploc bag after he was born to help regulate his body temperature, and now searching for and never finding my son again. I have but one choice, and that is the times of trial and tribulation to have that peace and be still. As I alluded to previously, that stillness does, stillness does provide an easy target for many who do not understand peace hope, and even faith. Some, including Tisha, feasted on my stillness, attack, and yes, left several scars. And one of these scars comes in the form of the financial and residential ruin that began in the early days of this ordeal. I'm just going to skip this part because I don't want to make this any more about me. I'm not seeking any restitution, Your Honor. For the $1.50 a month I received from the defendant, Tisha, would just keep me connected to her for the rest of my life, and I don't want that. So absolutely no restitution, Your Honor. The murderer of which I speak was not always such. When I met Tisha, she was beautiful, extremely intelligent, as many have testified to, and a seemingly successful woman. A far cry from the nappy-headed, murderous, narcissistic, and arrogantly flippant human being that sits in our midst today. Having a background in teaching, social work, higher education, Certified babysitting and endless amount of credentials that should render one trustworthy when it relates to the safety of children. However, although, the rema although she remains too much a coward to state the facts of what she did to Gannon, too much a lily livered, self centered, pathological liar to ask for forgiveness, 
It's too much the facade of one who actually cares for others to have taken her frustration out on an adult or one who could defend themselves. She will one day give an account through her words or through her time. Sending pictures of Gannis sleeping to Landon and I was telling as the boy looked pale and absent of the energies that so defined him. This is what a happy, healthy little boy looks like when he's sleeping in the next picture. That's what a little boy sleeping looks like. These pictures on the screen are of a happy, healthy little boy that's sleeping sweetly, healthily where he lay. The impact Tisha had as a result of this heinous crime stretches far wider and far deeper than I could depict through my statement today. Two other people torn to pieces as a result of this are Gannon's sister, Lena, and Harley. Speaking of Harley, I feel as though as I've lost two children as a result of this tragedy, one of which I will never see on this earth again, and the other which I do not know if a relationship can be salvaged with. Now for Lena. The video you saw as, as submitted in evidence, her bebopping down the street, is actually an excellent depiction of Lena and her happiness and her joy in life. She is very loving, trusting, and at times way too social. Normally, you might be concerned by your little girl talking to the utility guy working in the front yard, but in this case, it was the inside of her own home that was of grave concern. Nonetheless, her loss, Lena's loss, is like none I can even imagine. She lost her big brother, her only brother at the time. I still do not know if she has fully processed or fully understands the gravity of the situation, but regardless, has pressed forward and is thriving as best as she can. I am so proud of her. And these are her words. Once again, they're in yellow, so I'll do the best I can. And this is what I asked her if she wanted to say anything to Tisha, and this is what she said in her sweetest mind that she has, that you do, do, that you do not do that to people, especially your stepkids, and that it is never all right to do these things. How sweeter of a response can you get? Now for my precious, premature firstborn son, Get it? I never in my wildest dreams would have ever thought you'd be in danger, buddy, or I'd you know I wouldn't have not left you. <laughs> that home with what turned out to be your murderer and the last person to ever see you on this earth. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Through a father's eyes, children are truly a gift from God, and among the best and most perfect creations God can make. Your Honor, I do need to clear one thing up with the defense. It was said both in the opening statement and in the closing, somehow again it has been compared to a demon. And I understand the process, I do. But if they want to take the case up of Gannon being a demon, I will line people up from Alaska to Denver to Colorado Springs all the way to South Carolina to testify against them. Gannon was nobody's demon. I don't care how much anyone was abused or anything, he was not anyone's demon. Oh, okay. Again, it was truly... Again, it was truly my buddy. Very recently, before he died, the most alarming thing he did was call me dad. Up until age 10 or 11, I was daddy. But in the last months of his life, I was just dad. A signal that he was coming into those junior high, pre-teenage years. Another amazing thing that is he finally started asking me regularly to play ball with him. He was never too much into sports for most of his life, but that last six to nine months, he really started enjoying playing ball. Some of the most memorable times were him running little five-yard football routes in the street in front of our house. Most of the time, he dropped the ball, but he kept asking, let's do it again. I almost had it that time, Daddy. Oh, and that Nintendo Switch. One of the most difficult pieces of evidence to give up was his Nintendo is that probably has the most of him on it. Knowing I may never see that again is truly devastating. For him, many of his games were not just games, but a challenge to overcome. 
as I made him beat specific games before I would buy him the next one. I remember not long before he died, him beating the old school Zelda game he had. As he felt he was getting close to beating the final monster, he paused it, ran upstairs, and we sat at the kitchen island, and he beat, he beat it right there together with me. He was as excited as I ever saw him. With all of that and all of the pain of only being able to see him play through the one YouTube video he was able to make, which I'm about to play, I can sleep in peace at night because the father I am and the son he is was culminated as always in our final embrace as he ran out of arms and downstairs to watch Pokemon, I in his heart and he in mine. If we could try to play that video, just maybe the first 10 or 15 seconds of it. Hey guys, and today I'm I'm about to play some Sonic Mania. Alright, let's zoom in. And yes, cameraman is right here. Grandpa Solar White Gaming. And yes, shout out for our channels. We're going to be doing a lot of these together. Give the shout out to him, his channel. Freedom! Fresh. Thank you. I was one of the many he hoped to make and the only one he was actually able to make. I do want to add something that I don't have in my speech that um, I, me and Landon already had a conversation about this and I owe her an apology as well as she already gave me one that we allowed Tisha to manipulate us into some of the pain and disagreements that we had between one another. And I, Landon, I'm sorry. But I will say this, Tisha was not the glue to keep everything together. She was not the answer. And this is not a jab, Landon, okay? But Le Lena still lives with me. Tisha, you were not the answer. Now, Your Honor, if I have any influence on the final sentence for Tisha, first I ask to be stripped of my last name immediately. It's nauseating and infuriating to hear her called Miss Stout this past three years. Secondly, I ask that for every mile, she drove, drove Gannon across the country. She spent one day in solitary confinement. I think that take us in between three and four years. After that journey is complete, I recommend her sentence be equal to every year she stripped off of Gannon's life, which for the average male in America right now is 77. So that would give her 66 more years in addition to the 11 he lived. Lastly, for every year of Harley's life that she abusively manipulated that child, she should have an additional year of prison. That adds 21 years to the total. I think without parole, that should suffice. I pray also that Tisha lives the fullest and happiest life that any inmate possibly can live. I also pray that every night before she falls asleep, her last breath before she drifts off sounds just like the breath that she describes Gannon breathing as life left his body. And that all through her sleep, she dreams of all the fun they had at Disney and other places we went throughout our time together. And that every morning as she is about to wake, the end of the, her dream, the last words Gannon spoke to her screamed and cried, Tisha, stop. You're hurting me. Why, Tisha? Daddy, help me. I want my mommy. Why couldn't you let her just be a mama's boy? That's all he wanted to be. He just loved his mama. I wish she would tell me what those words were so I would know. And then as she speaks those words, the sound of a gunshot goes off and she wakes. Every day and night I pray she relives just those moments. And then wakes up to a nice, warm, and kosher breakfast. In conclusion, I would like to share a picture of Gannon in his final state and final rest resting place and thank everyone that has had a positive impact on my family and I, to everyone that has shared the positive impact Gannon has had on your life, from a proud and broken father, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. I'd like to pause until we can get that last photo up. Again, they're not showing us anything. We can't see the TV screen, so this is what we can see. Oh, man. I think that concludes the uh, comment from family and friends, Judge. So, 
I'm not sure if you're ready to hear sentencing comments from me or if you want to do a different process. Um, I, let me hear the sentencing comments from you. The last person that I always hear from in a sentencing is the defendant. So, okay. Can I have just a moment? You may. Go ahead. I guess, what, do you think she's going to say something, you guys? Yeah, just uh, in the abundance of caution, I would ask the court to keep restitution open for a period of time. Um, obviously, Mr. Stauk is not asking for any restitution, but there may be some that we want to submit, and so I would ask the court to keep that open. Well, based on um, the uh, new case regarding timelines, I'm going to give you uh, 49 days to submit an order. Thank you. Um, if there is an objection, you'll need to file the objection within 14 days after that. And that'll get us all right. So 49 days, uh, 14 if there's an objection. And if there is, we'll have a hearing. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Judge, I'm not going to uh, make a long drawn out statement. I think the comments from the family and friends of the Stout family um, said it better than I ever could about the impact that Gannon had on their lives. Um, the loss of, of Gannon from his family and to this community uh, will never be made right through this process. We all know that. The defendant, through her own actions, tore Gannon's family apart, tore this community apart, and at the same time, I've never seen a community come together the way this community did in the face of such tragedy over an 11-year-old boy who most of us never knew. The defendant manipulated this community, Gannon's family, the investigation. I've been a prosecutor for a long time, Judge. You've seen a lot of cases. I've never seen the kind of horror that this defendant brought down on a community and a family. The torture that Gannon had to suffer in the last moments of his life are unspeakable. No matter what sentence you give us, Judge, and I, and I know what that sentence is going to be for the most part, no matter what the sentence is, we'll never bring Gannon back. But it will go a long ways towards healing, healing this community. I hope healing Landon. I hope healing Al. They're going to live the rest of their lives second guessing every decision they made as it relates to leaving their children in the care of this defendant. Through no, no fault of their own. Judge, on count one and count two, uh, count two merges into count one. The only sentence available is life in prison without parole. As to count four, Tampering with a deceased human body, driving Gannon's body over 1,300 miles away, hiding it from view, hoping it would never be found, ask for the maximum sentence of 12 years, Judge, and that it be running consecutive to the life in prison without parole. Tampering with physical evidence is an F6. It's one to one and a half years. I ask that you give max on that as well and run that consecutive. Judge, we do have that other pending case, 20CR3170, hanging out there. In the grand scheme of things, um, well, I'd love to prosecute this defendant for that charge as well. Uh, in the interest of justice, I would like to see this defendant in Department of Corrections custody as soon as possible. And so we are dismissing that count or that charge. Thank you, Judge. All right, at this point in time, uh, the defense has an opportunity uh, to uh, present uh, statements in mitigation. Mr. Tellini. Mm -hmm.
uh, give me an order. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, Ms. Stauk, I heard what your attorney had to say, but I need to hear it from you. You have a right to uh, address the court at this point in time regarding any uh, matter that you want me to consider for sentencing. Do you have anything that you wish for me to consider, ma'am? All right. Actually, there is. Go ahead. Consider this or request to admit. Reflect a request for Kirby Place in San Carlos. I don't have the ability to do that. Um, the DOC determines uh, where uh, its inmates go, um, and I'm not going to make a recommendation one way or the other. Um, and I, I'm going to apologize before I do this. Um, I've heard a lot. Um, I'm going to take about 10 minutes to put my thoughts in order. Um, I'll come back with my sentencing at 325. All rise. A parent's worst nightmare is getting a phone call letting them know that something has happened to their child. How much worse must that nightmare be when law enforcement asks not for a picture of your loved one, but rather DNA and dental records? I've also heard it said that one of the worst tragedies a parent can experience is to outlive a child. I have known people both professionally and personally who have gone through that. It never leaves them, but the sharpness of the pain does diminish to some extent over time. I cannot fathom the pain Mr. Stauk and Ms. Bullard have experienced as a result of the defendant's actions. A sentence in a criminal case such as this will not change the fact that their son's life was taken from them, and no sentence I impose and nothing I say will ever change that fact. Ms. Stauk, you betrayed the person you loved enough to marry. You told your husband lies and took away someone he loved. You took away every day that Mr. Stauk or Ms. Bullard could have had with their son. When you take a life, regardless of how you do that, you forever alter the future. Neither Mr. Stauk nor Ms. Bullard will ever see their son graduate from high school, go through the joy and the pain of that first love, or get married. They will never know what kind of impact their son may have had on the world if only he had lived to become an adult. And had Gannon's body not been found, they never would have known what happened to Gannon. They would always have had a lingering doubt about what happened to Gannon. And I cannot imagine the pain and sense of loss associated with that. You betrayed your daughter, Harley Hunt. I cannot imagine the emotional impact that you have had on her due to your selfish and calculated actions. This is a young woman that trusted you to put her interests above yours. This is a young woman who believed in you and believed you were innocent of this crime right up until the time that you pled not guilty by reason of insanity. And she still loves you. That's natural for a child, and it doesn't matter how much older they get. You were supposed to protect her. I cannot imagine the guilt she feels or the therapy that she will need to address your portrayal. There is no evidence that she had anything to do with the murder or your cover-up of it but some people still think that she is somehow involved. 
she wasn't. The incredible strength of will and courage that it took for her to come in and testify is amazing to me. But she did it because, as she said, it was the right thing to do. And while, thankfully, she didn't testify, let's not forget about Lena. You betrayed her too. You took her brother from her and forever altered her family dynamics. She will always wonder who she can trust and will always feel that loss. She was there the day you killed Gannon. His body was still in the house when she got back from school. At some point, you even claimed this eight-year-old girl helped you move her brother's body from the basement to the back of your car. That's just simply not true. As she gets older, Lena is going to want to know more, and she's going to want to know if there was something that she could have done to prevent this. I hope she comes to realize that she has no fault in all of this. You betrayed your stepson, and you took his life. You took away everything he was and everything he could ever become. I can't imagine the terror and confusion that he must have felt in the last moments of his life when he knew his life was being taken by someone he trusted to protect it. Your attempt to raise the claim that you did this because of your adverse childhood is also a betrayal of people that have mental health issues. It is no secret that there is a large part of our population that has mental health issues. It's also no secret that our country and our health system could do a much better job addressing mental health issues than it does. However, the number of people with mental health issues who become violent is small, and the number who become murderers is smaller still. Your claim that a mental health issue caused the murder in this case is a disservice to all those who struggle with mental health issues every day. This isn't the first case I have presided over in which sanity or a mental condition of the defendant has been raised as a defense. I have had cases where the defendant's mental condition caused the defendant to act out in a certain fashion. But even in those cases, I have never seen conduct like this. I understand the claim of disassoci dissociative identity disorder. I have seen something resembling that, and I have seen defendants with schizophrenic disorders. I can understand those. What I have seen is that the mental condition causes the person to act a certain way, and when they realize what they did, they are astonished by what happened, or they have no memory of what happened. Your claim is that it was another personality that murdered Gannon, but there is no time during the minutes, hours, and days following the murder where Letitia came out and wondered, gee, why am I carrying a body around in my luggage? That just isn't credible. You knew what you were doing. You made a number of clear and conscious decisions to cover or disguise what you had done. Claiming a lack of motive is a common defense tactic, and it can be a sound strategy. The truth is, however, that it only takes a moment to make a bad decision that results in disastrous consequences. And oftentimes, we never know why a defendant chose a particular course of action. However, that does not mean that they did not intend to undertake a course of action. Sometimes, as in this case, the likely explanation is anger. An 11-year-old boy with burns who feels that he's not being taken care of. An 11-year-old boy on the verge of being a teenager. Those of us who have lived through people or kids with, uh, that were teenagers, we know how that is. It is not hard to imagine Gannon saying something, you're not my mom. I want my mom. I want my dad. And that would be enough to make you really angry. 
but anger is not an excuse. A defendant is responsible for the choices they made and the actions they undertook, even though those choices arose out of or remote or were motivated by anger. It's clear that you hated and were jealous of Landon Bullard. You saw yourself as a better mother than she was. It's clear from the evidence that you had some resentment from being left with Mr. Stout's children. It's clear you had some resentment toward Mr. Stout because he traveled as part of his job. Some of that manifested as early as Al's assignment in Alaska when you made allegations against the people in his unit. That caused Al to have to return from Alaska. And in one of the phone calls that were played for the jury, you talked about having to take care of his kids while he was away and what a good mother, were, uh, what a good mother you were. It's clear you felt trapped. You wanted out. You were searching for a new job and a new location in Florida. Mr. Stauk had been gone on his, assi- on his new assignment for less than two days when the fire in the basement occurred. I can imagine that you saw your whole future consisting of taking care of Mr. Stout's children while he was off doing his thing, and that's not the future that you wanted. I can imagine Gannon at some point after he sustained his burns telling you you wanted his real mom and how that comment would have made you angry. You took your frustration and anger for the marriage, the child care, the absence of Al, and even living in Colorado. You took all of that out on Gannon. The evidence suggests you first stabbed Gannon repeatedly, 18 times. Based on the number of defensive wounds, he was clearly conscious for some of that. He was certainly gravely wounded. And chillingly, it would also explain how you were able to mimic the sound of Gannon breathing in one of your sessions with Dr. Lewis. Those were probably close to his last breaths. He was dying, but not dead. The evidence could also lead one to conclude that he either fell or rolled off the bed where you shot him in the head and then beat him with the butt of a gun or a baseball bat. That would explain the blood found at different levels on the walls in Gannon's bedroom. I'm also reminded of the look you had on your face when you slipped your handcuffs while being transported back to Colorado and attacked Deputy James. I shudder to think that that was probably the last thing that Gannon saw before he died. You have shown no remorse throughout this process. Instead, you've made a choice to build a web of lies. When you gave an interview to Detective Jessica Bethel on January 29 of 2020, you told her you lied to her about Gannon running away and that he was actually taken by a guy named Eduardo. When you explained that to Detective Bethel, you said... You needed to lie because you didn't want to face the consequences. You told her that you were trying to come up with a plan about what you should do. And finally, you told her you really thought you could fix this. I think that's true. You lied because you didn't want to face the consequences. You needed to come up with a plan to fix this, and that plan involved covering up what you had done. It involved lie upon lie. But you slipped up at various points and let kernels of truth escape. In one conversation with Mr. Stauk, you told him the FBI needed to close the borders of Colorado, needed to close I-95. I-95 doesn't go through Colorado. It's an interstate that runs along the entire eastern seaboard. It's also not far from where you dumped Gannon's body. When questioned by Detective Bethel, you told her that Mr. Stauk might also make up some kind of story about you coming at him with a knife. You said you would never use a knife like that. Yet Gannon was stabbed 18 times. 
Your actions in this case also show a very conscious attempt to avoid responsibility in this case. You started out with the story that Gannon had run away. You gave some hints that it might be related to bath salts or drug use by Gannon. You stayed with that story until you were called into uh, EPSO for an interview. You knew they weren't going to buy the story that Gannon ran away. Then you came up with the abduction. And you stayed with some iteration of that for a long time. But all of those versions had one thing in common. You were always the victim. In one, you're beaten and raped and Gannon was abducted. In one, someone stole Gannon out of a truck in the parking lot. In another, you let Gannon, uh, someone drive Gannon to a hospital to take care of a head injury that he had after falling off a bike. In all of them, you could claim it wasn't your fault. You were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Then, you got arrested. You stuck to the story that it was someone else that took Gannon. During the hours that you spoke with Special Agent Grusing, he told you he thought sometimes good people do bad things and sometimes it's an accident. Then they found Gannon's body. Then you saw the mountain of evidence against you. And this is a mountain the size of Everest. What was your position after that? Well, it was an accident. And you, Leticia, didn't even do it. It was Maria Sanchez. You carefully crafted your new story to continue to avoid responsibility. It also allowed you to take advantage of the out that Mr. Grusing and Mr. Stout suggested much, much earlier when they asked you if this was an accident. Now it was an accident. Your Maria Sanchez personality shot Gannon by mistake because she thought he was an intruder in a cape. Multiple personalities is not credible in this setting, as regardless of how many personalities you have, you only have one body. I have presided over cases where a mental disease or defect prevented a defendant from remembering the course of events, including the commission of the crime. Without exception. Those defendants have been terrified when contacted by law enforcement because there was a period of time in their lives that they could not account for. Their body may have sustained an injury, and they don't know how it happened. They may have some new object in their house or on their person, and they have no idea where they got it from. We all have free will. And we all make choices based on that free will. The people who suffer from the mental disorder you claim are terrified because their free will has been taken from them and they are subject, being subjected to things and experiences they don't understand and don't have any recollection of. You didn't behave anything like that. One of the purposes is to impose an appropriate sentence for the criminal conduct that occurred. Another purpose is to punish an offender by imposing a sentence that takes into account the seriousness of the offense. Yet another purpose of sentencing is to prevent crime and promote respect for the law by providing an effective, an effective deterrent to others likely to commit a similar offense. Anyone who's been in my courtroom before knows that I've said sentencings are the most difficult thing that I do. That's especially true in cases where someone has lost his or her life. Nothing I or the law can, er, uh, can do will ever bring that person back. I have handled hundreds, if not thousands, of criminal cases over the years. I think at this point in my career, I've presided over something like 200 jury trials. I've sentenced hundreds more defendants pursuant to plea agreements. This is not the first murder case that has come before me. This is not the first case I have presided over which involves harm to a child. This is not the first case I have had where a person who was in an unhappy marriage committed a crime. Sadly, statistically, there is a high correlation between violent acts, including uh, murders, and family members. 
I have had a number of cases which have demonstrated one person's capacity for cruelty toward another human being. I can, however, say without hesitation that the facts in this case are the most horrific I have ever seen. Your conduct in this case deserves the maximum punishment that I can impose under Colorado law. As such, with respect to the charge of first-degree murder after deliberation, I remand you to the custody of the Colorado Department of Corrections for the remainder of your life with no possibility of parole. With respect to the charge of murder in the first degree of a child under 12 by a person in a position of trust, I remand you to the custody of Colorado Department of Corrections for the remainder of your life with no possibility of parole. Those two sentences will merge. If you have questions about that, you can ask your attorneys. With respect to the charge of tampering with a deceased human body, I'm also going to sentence you to 12 years, followed by a three-year period of parole. That sentence is to be consecutive to the life sentences that I've already imposed. With respect to tampering with physical evidence, I'm going to impose an 18-month sentence. That sentence is also consecutive uh, to, the murder to the sentences for the murder charges that I have imposed. I also understand with the consent of the prosecution, and I'm assuming no objection from the defense, that I will dismiss all the charges in 20 CR 3170, close that out subject to restitution, give the people uh, 49 days for restitution, 14 days for response. And if there's an issue, we will set it within the 90 days, uh, within 90 days from. I think that resolves all outstanding matters. Is there anything else that the prosecution wishes for me to address? No, Your Honor, thank you. Defense? Yes. Court will be in recess. Yes. <laughs> oh, my word. Cover.